Well, hello everybody. Um, apologies for not getting this um, um, card up earlier. Um, I think we are now all sorted and ready to go. Um, so thank you all very much for coming along. Um, I'm Catherine Croft and I will turn on my video so you can see me, I think. Um, Um, okay. I'm not going to, right, I, I will just speak and don't, don't, um, I, I'm sure we will be fine once we get onto the actual slides of buildings and you don't need to see me. I'm Catherine, I'm the Director of 20th Century Society. I'm just here to welcome you all and to explain that 20th Century Society is the National Building Preservation Organisation for buildings from 1914 onwards and that we, we exist to campaign to make sure the buildings that we care about survive. We get them listed and then we negotiate with architects and developers to make sure that any alterations are sympathetic to the buildings. Um, we also do, in normal times, a lot of fantastic trips, both in the UK and abroad. And tonight we are um, thinking back to our fantastic trip that we had to Japan um, in 2017, which was led by um, Professor Neil Jackson, who um, is the author of um, the best book, really, that you could have to introduce you to uh, Japanese architecture and particularly the influence that it's had on architecture here in the West. And, um, and also John East, who is a longtime member of the society and an um, excellent photographer who comes on practically all our trips and takes stunning pictures. So we, we, um, we normally do this event once a year. We re review some of our trips and we do it at Cowcross Street where we have our offices. And usually I have to um, prize John off the lectern at nine o'clock when they're wanting to shut the building down because he always has a lot to say. So it was probably naive to think that we could get um, the whole of Japan into one Zoom event, which we tried to do two weeks ago. Um, there was far too much for, it for us to, to include. So we've come back for the Reflections on Japan part two. So enormous thanks to both Neil and John for being up for, for coming back for a second helping. And um, I will hand over to Neil in just a second. Beyond, the, the last thing I need to say is that, um, you know, we are a charity. We um, I'll have lost quite a lot of money in terms of um, we usually do these events for, for profit and plough the, the income back into our casework. We're obviously not able to do that at the moment. So although it's been free to sign up tonight, if you felt you were able to donate, we'd be incredibly grateful. And we have a set of four greetings cards made from John's photographs. We have some of Japan. What you're seeing at the moment is four pictures of India. But if you donate tonight, I'll, um, we have four, four cards of um, some amazing shots of Japan that we'll send you out as a token of our appreciation. So um, with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Neil. Right, I think we're there. Hello, good evening, konnichiwa. This um, presentation I'm going to give you is actually a prelude to John's wonderful photographs and it's going to be in a sense in two parts. I'm going to run through what we saw last week very quickly and then um, when we get to Kyoto I'll be starting on what we're going to see today and I'll take you through to the end of our tour because I'm sure you want to know um, the complete route that we followed. And then we'll go back 
as it were, to the middle of my presentation, and John will pick up with his illustrations then and uh, show us about, I don't know, 200 pictures, it seems to me, of what we looked at. So fasten your seat belts and um, welcome to Japan. This uh, was part one. And, oh, let's, sorry, something jumped then. And as the Japanese would say, um, Pato Ichi. And the bit of Japan we were looking at, we were visiting, was this lower half of Honshu, uh, from Tokyo down to Hiroshima. And we arrived in Tokyo after a long flight, and the group leader looked exhausted even before we started. But we were met at the airport by the wonderful Aiko Ito, uh, representing Cox and Kings, the travel company with whom we were traveling. And we were whisked off almost immediately to the Prince Hotel, who welcomed the 20th Society of Japan. It wasn't a good start in the sense we arrived in the middle of a hurricane, or tornado, I should say. It was um, incredibly wet and visibility was terrible. But not to worry, the next day everything was beautiful. It was a, a completely different world. And we went to the park at Ueno, where all the museums are, and we looked at um, this building by Le Corbusier and of course uh, lots of other fabulous structures. The three or four days in Tokyo allows, allowed us to see a lot of work. This one is by uh, Kisho Kurakawa, the very famous uh, Nagajin capsule tower, which is really the emblem of the Japanese metabolist movement. Our last day in Tokyo, we went to see the Olympic Stadium by Kenzo Tangi. And here I, I venture to suggest there's something really quite suggestive of the samurai armor that the Japanese would wear in the Edo period. Um, that's the sort of 17th, 18th and early 19th century. And this is a, a feature that appears more than once in modern Japanese architecture. We got on the Shinkansen, the fast train from Tokyo, and we went down to Nagoya, which is down there. And immediately the, the next day, we got on a bus which had our name on the front, which is really quite reassuring, and went to Mejimura, which is an extraordinary open-air architectural museum with about 80 buildings in it. Uh, not all complete, but um, quite often large amounts of buildings which have come from a long way and been rebuilt here. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel. This is really only the um, entrance foyer and um, reception first reception rooms. It was a much, much bigger building, but much of it has in fact ended up here. So if you want to see this building, um, this is where you have to come to this architectural museum. From Nagoya, we went to Ichinomiya, again on the bus, to a fascinating building again by Tangi, very Corbusian in its influence, a building for um, the textile industry, a big meeting hall, and then to Hashima to see the um, city hall by Junso Sakukura. And Sakukura was one of the three Japanese who worked for uh, Le Corbusier. And he was the, the one who perhaps stayed in Le Corbusier's office in Paris the longest during the 1930s. Then on in the same trip on to Gifu. And there there was a, a group of um, high-rise residential buildings built by a selection of international architects, all of whom were women. And this is the, um, the building by uh, Kazuyo Sejima, who is the uh, lady who leads uh, San, uh, Sana. It's, um, I think, somewhat demanding, particularly if you uh, have to go up the stairs because the elevator isn't working, but it's nevertheless quite quite riveting to look at. And that evening we ended up in Kyoto, the red dot on the left. No time to look at Kyoto, straight out the next day to Nishinomiya, where we visited a building that looks awfully like the Imperial Hotel um, at Mejimura. This is the um, Imperial Hotel of the West, as they called it, and it was built by Arata Enzo, who had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright on the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And 
it's another brick building of exquisite detail and very fanciful decoration. It is now a school of architecture for women's students. Then on the following day, we went, um, we come back to Kyoto, we went on to, oops, I'm running ahead of myself. We've come back to Kyoto, and this is actually where we're about to pick up the second half of the tour. So as the Japanese would say, uh, Pato Ni. And I'll run through what we are going to see in Pato Ni and give you an idea. It's um, no longer John's wonderful photographs. It's sort of holiday snap showing what a good time we had. And the first place we uh, went on to from, from Kyoto was um, Uji. And here's a, a fabulous temple. It's the Phoenix Hall at the Biodin Temple. And it's the building that is on the 10 yen coin, which you can see here on the left. It was very influential on the work of Frank Lloyd Wright because a copy of this was built in the 1893 World Columbians Fair in Chicago. And this is Frank Lloyd Wright's really first introduction, uh, one generation removed as it were, to Japanese architecture. From there we went to the ancient capital at Nara and to see the, the largest timber building in the world. Here we picked up our, our new guide, um, Hiroyuki Maikawa, who you can see there in the striped shirt in the middle with the, um, the flag that all Japanese tour guides carry. And then back to uh, Kyoto and the following day on to Hiroshima where of course the first atomic bomb was dropped. The bomb exploded just um, about a hundred yards or so, horizontally as it were, although it was at an elevation from this building on the right, which is now the um, atom bomb dome or the A-bomb dome. And you can see it's got a heron standing there on the, on the parapet. The building on the left, which John will be showing you in more detail, is the uh, branch bank of the Bank of Japan, the Hiroshima Branch Bank, and that survived the blast um, almost unscathed, but everybody inside was killed. It was about 400 meters from the epicenter. And then from uh, Hiroshima, we went on the train all the way back to Tokyo, a late night journey. So we're back at the right hand side of the map where we had really almost the last opportunity, I think, to indulge in the excellent cuisine of Japan, whether that is uh, matcha, the green tea ice cream that you can see on the left, or these beautiful, delicately arranged um, plates and dishes with uh, traditional Japanese food in them. On the last day, the last full day, we went down to Yokohama, the great port, and there discovered a very curious building, which is the Yokohama International Port Terminal, uh, built by foreign office architects. And then just a bit further down the coast, we went to Kamakura. And that's um, really where our tour ended. And that was the last opportunity to have more matcha ice cream that you can see on the left. And we said goodbye once again to um, Aiko Ito, who had become our guide uh, for the last few days of the, of the tour back at the Tokyo end of the map. So there we are, that's um, what we did as a brief overview of what you're going to be seeing, which is new. And it was um, a sort of fascinating journey. The last night was spent in Tokyo and then most of us came home, but a few people carried on uh, making their own tour around Japan, which was, I think, rather, rather good. So, part two, or part two, me, yes. and over to John. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, excellent. So, John, are you poised? Yep. Loading your slides. Great. Over to you. Right. 
Right, Neil, back to Kyoto. Okay, this is on the north side of Kyoto. It's the Kyoto International Conference Center, built in 1964 to 66, one in petition by Satyo Otani and it's a huge building and we're seeing it from the far end of a lake but I think John's got yes more close-up pictures. This is another building that I sort of argue is based upon Japanese uh, samurai armor and if you know what this looks like think of the shoulder guards that they have on the armor and the the shapes of the helmets and so on. This is an inherently a Japanese building and of course it's all concrete which seems to be the material of choice for much Japanese architecture. It withstands earthquakes very well. It's compri it comprises about three different blocks and there are various signs and barriers saying do not enter as you can see there in the picture which didn't seem to stop any of us and nobody challenged us so it was um Rather nice to see this in the late evening. Then back to central uh, Kyoto, and here right next to the railway station is the Kyoto Television Tower of 1963 to 64 by Maromo Yamada, which looks wonderful at night. And you get a very good view of this from this extraordinary station building by Hiroshihara, the Kyoto station of 1991 to 97. If you wonder why it takes so long to build a station, look at the complexity, scale and size of this building. It's about 10 or more floor levels that step up and up and up, indoors to begin with, then outdoors onto terraces and galleries and with restaurants and shops all around them. It is a fascinating place and really rather wonderful at night time, as you can see here. You've got to have a head for heights to enjoy some of these terraces. This is down inside. Restaurants. Um, yes, Japanese food to be recommended. Okay, the um, uh, Ryoanji Gardens at the temple there, very early temple from um, about 1450 uh, by Hasukawa Katsumoto. It is um, a beautiful complex of gardens, of temple buildings, and you know the very famous Zen Garden, which is just adjacent to this building here, where one can sit on the steps and contemplate the gravel. Now we're just on the outside of the complex here. Okay, we're going now to the uh, Nijo Castle at Kyoto. Um, this is the Karamon Gate, 1625 to 26. One doesn't think of traditional Japanese architecture as having uh, masonry construction because largely there wasn't any, except when you find these castle walls. And, you know, these are hefty hefty bits of masonry. This is like the Maya and the Aztec in Central America. It is extraordinary construction. And this was built for the first um, of the uh, Tokugawa shoguns, who was Shogun uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu. And he, he ruled only from 1603 to 1605, but started a dynasty that ran the way all the way through till um, 16... 48, I think it was. No, sorry, 1658. Um, buildings in the complex there. Try and think of these in terms of, you know, Western architecture. We're in the, in the Stuart period here. This is, um, you know, what they were doing. And we were doing all those early modern houses with um, stone architecture. Japanese architecture is almost exclusively timber framed, as you can see in these buildings. It's based upon a module. The module is the size of the tatami mat, which is almost exactly six feet by three feet. So you can gauge how many feet there are between the 
columns that you see here. You can see the panelling on the wall. It's all modular in exactly that same way. This is the same module that's used from, for every Japanese building, from the peasant hut through to the, uh, the shogun's building. It is only the imperial palace, which was in um, Kyoto as well, that has a larger module in that six foot three inches by three foot three inches. You can see the tatami mats, or you could just then, on the floor. And I expect we'll be seeing more examples of this. There are the mats, the shoji screens, the fusuma, these sliding walls. The rooms are completely fluid in terms of their space and containment um, constantly changes. Uh, the Sierra Gardens at Nijo Castle. The Japanese garden and the Japanese house are one and the same thing. You cannot separate them um, artistically or philosophically. Uh, bonsai trees, those little things on the blue uh, stand. And this is pruning a giant bonsai tree. Yes, those are people up there. Okay, so the Phoenix Hall. Uh, the Bayodin Temple at Uji, the building that's on the 10 yen coin. One looks at this and thinks how wonderfully Japanese and then one might think how wonderfully Chinese, which is not very difficult because the arrangement is essentially the same. And if you want to stretch a point, you can say, but that's a Palladian arrangement, isn't it? central pavilion, long arms and side wings with end pavilions. I think Palladio uh, must have been to Japan. No, don't take that seriously. <laughs> There's a number of older buildings within this complex. Uh, this is the Jodorian Sub Temple, 1480. Heavy tiled roofs to provide weight to make stability so when earthquakes happen the buildings don't fall over. And then a modern version as it were of the of the same thing. Um, a new building 19 I think it's 1991 now in a sense to interpret the traditional Japanese uh, building in steel and glass and aluminium. This is the administrative building, the shop building, and um, well as I say it's very very typical of Japanese architecture in the modern idiom. Okay, um, John, next one. Right, so we went on from um, Uji to Nara, and this is the great Southgate Temple Complex, Southgate to the Temple Complex at Nara, dating from 1199 to 1203. Huge building, um, and I think this is where we stopped last time because I remember talking about the deer that wander around here. You can buy packets of nuts to feed the deer, except the instructions are in Japanese, so most of the tourists who can't read Japanese uh, I think the nuts are for eating. The deer get very upset at this. <laughs> Here we are inside the uh, Todaiji, the great temple at Nara. There's an outside view of it. Japanese school kids in the foreground, all in uniform, as they always seem to do. They wear tartan uniforms quite often, which is somewhat incongruous, at least if you're coming from Scotland. So the great temple, the Todaiji, started in 752, has been burnt a few times, but it is still a huge, huge structure with the Buddha figure sitting in the center there.
This building, like the house, the house is, is again modular, it's framed, it has sliding walls, shoji, futsuma, that sort of architecture. It's absolutely um, ubiquitous across the whole palette of uh, traditional Japanese building. Notice once more that very heavy roof with the, the tiles. The pagoda, 1426. Um, Chinese influence, Buddhist building. And here at Nara, which was the ancient capital of Japan, there's um, a number of um, buildings which are not religious buildings, uh, such as this one here, which is by Tokumo Katayama, the Nara National Museum, 1894, building very much in the manner of um, French architecture. And Katayama is one of the first four Japanese students to be trained in Western architecture at the Imperial College of Engineering. And their professor was the 25 year old Josiah Condor, who came over uh, from England. He'd been working for William Burgess and he came to Japan to be professor of architecture at the new Imperial College of Engineering. And he stayed in Japan for the rest of his life. So he taught the architecture that he'd seen in, um, well, with which he'd been working in England. This is the railway station in Nara, a 1930s building, sort of Art Deco goes Japanese or Japanese goes Art Deco by Shibato Shiro and Masuda Seichi. And the new um, Nara Centennial Hall, 1998 by Arata Izozaki, one of Japan's probably most prominent architects, um, still alive, quite an elderly gentleman. This is the Nara Prefectural Government Office building by uh, Teruro Katayama, 1964 to 65. This is a view from the courtyard, but we did get up onto the roof, which in a sense was the purpose of going here. And here's another building, which I would argue somehow um, plays games with the notion of the samurai armor. And look at that uh, structure on the roof. We'll see some closer views of it in a minute. There we go, we're up on the roof now. Um, clearly this is a recreational space. There's grass, there are nice seats, there's a great view. And then there's this extraordinary, I guess, ventilation tower. In the Naramachi district of um, old Nara, here's a merchant's house from about uh, the late 18th to mid 19th century. Very typical, you'd see them in Kyoto, uh, parts of Tokyo still, but um, certainly here in Nara. This is comparable in a sense to what uh, what we call Georgian street architecture. It's about the same date, has the same uniformity and um, you know, would be for, as I say, merchants, machia. Well, if you want a set of wheels, uh, Nara is the place to go. Now we are in Hiroshima. This is the Atomic Dome by a Czech architect, uh, Jan Letzel from uh, 1915 used to be the Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall. You can just, oh well, it will come up again. You can just see on the left there, right in the corner, the bridge, which was the, um, the target point for the atomic bomb. The bridge is T-shaped in plan. I think we're going to see some more pictures of it 
there was a T-shaped bridge and the bombardier on the Alina Gray had to sight the, um, the bomb on this bridge, a T-shaped bridge, and drop it and it exploded a few hundred feet above the ground. The bridge survived the blast, apparently it sort of bounced, but um, not much else did. Monuments uh, proliferate in Hiroshima, as you might expect. This is the former uh, kimono shop, the Taishoa kimono shop, now a rest home or rest house, 1929. This is the former Bank of Japan. I showed you a picture of that earlier. And it served as a hospital um, immediately after the blast, there's a school behind it which um, similarly survived the blast and these rooms and the space behind was used for congregating for the, um, the residents with the appalling injuries. This is the uh, Motoyasu Bridge of 1926, which uh, comes across from as it were, the city side onto the island where the Hiroshima Peace Park is located. And that's to the left of the picture. You can just see the dome again in the distance. And in the center of the, the Peace Park is the Memorial Cenotaph, uh, based upon a, a traditional funerary um, monument and there's an axial view that runs straight through the center of this uh, this park and terminates on the atomic dome that you can see at the end there. This was all laid out by Kenzo Tangi. This was his first really big project. He presented this um, in Europe um, in, the, in 1949 and this really put him on the international map. It was um, an enormously significant commission. And Tangi actually came from uh, Hiroshima. This was his native territory. This is the Memorial Tower to the Mobilized Students, again by Tangi, um, slightly later, 1967. I guess this is because it's all covered up is Togo Murano, the World Peace Memorial Cathedral. And it is exactly what it says. It's a cathedral for world peace. It's very much in the Western manner of a cathedral, um, central aisle, naves, sort of Romanesque form. It's a concrete building with a concrete frame expressed externally, infilled with um, concrete blocks. And the concrete blocks were made um, with ashes from the wood that survived, well the wood didn't survive the explosion, but the ashes that were left following the um, devastating fire that followed the explosion. And it's, it's, it's building in a sense made of the ruins of its city, of its own city. This is the uh, memorial hall and um, this is one end of that great long axis. We couldn't get to see it very well because as you can see it's got hoardings around it, it was being given a, a facelift but, <clears throat> but behind that central fountain uh, the axis runs all the way through to, the, uh, to the, the atomic dome at the far end. This was uh, Kenzo Tangi's really big breakthrough building as I said earlier 1949 to 1954 and it's raised off the ground on Pilotti. It shows without doubt um, the influence he owes to Le Corbusier, but at the same time it's a totally Japanese building and one recognizes that I think in the 
um, the, the screens that run across the front of the building there, these ribs in, um, in concrete, in reinforced concrete. There were a, additional buildings, one at each end. You can see the bridges going across, but these in the end were not built by, um, by Tangi, not to his original design anyway. And these were meant to be conference halls and hotels. But the, the central building is the great feature. So these are much later in 1989 and 1994. Uh, in one of them includes the, the sort of peace uh, clock, um, which I think is the number of days since the atomic uh, explosion. And then on the site uh, or the memorial uh, of uh, the atomic bomb is the, the sort of last in the whole line of buildings over the last 50 years, which is, this is the uh, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Hall of 2002, which I think was by um, uh, Tangi Associates. So uh, I think his firm, I mean, he was still alive. I think he lived until about 2005, uh, but I'm not sure that it's um, by him, but I think it is by his um, practice. Some of us um, slipped away um, over lunch. In fact, maybe one of us, maybe just me. Um, <laughs> uh, but this is the um, Motomachi and Chojuan high-rise apartment blocks in Hiroshima uh, of 1970 to 1973 by uh, Masato Otaka, who was um, a metabolist. And indeed, this is uh, an example of uh, late metabolism and, and really, thinking about 1970-73, you know, very, you know, um, contemporaneous uh, with, for example, Robin Hood Gardens, uh, and actually slightly larger scale, um, uh, and a whole city within a city. Um, but unlike uh, Robin Hood Gardens, rather better looked after, it has to be said, and, and, and very much still enjoyed. And then for Hiroshima to bring us bang up to date, this is the um, Shin uh, Hakushima Station um, by Koala Kanth and Associates of 2013 to 2015, um, which I think, if I remember rightly, um, uh, is part of the, the line which goes straight back to Tokyo. Um, but uh, a really rather lovely uh, little sort of station uh, uh, building. next to um, the metabolist uh, 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 housing. So back to you, um, Neil. Thank you. Shin is the Japanese word for new. So Shin uh, Hiroshima means the new Hiroshima station. And if you're traveling in Japan, you've got to realize this. Otherwise you get out at what you think is the central station. It turns out you're in the new station, which will be out in the suburbs somewhere. It can be very confusing. In fact, much of it can be very confusing. So we are now um, on the uh, penultimate day at Yokohama. Uh, Yokohama was enormously important. It was the um, really the first uh, Western stronghold, if I can use that word, it's not the right word, but the first Western base for trade in Japan. And from here, the first train ran from the port through to uh, Tokyo. And I think we're going to see the Tokyo end of the line um, shortly. This is the, uh, the, the Yokohama Saikin Bank by uh, Tsumaki Yonaka. And it is you know, straight out of um, Vienna or somewhere like that. It's a very brazen bit of uh, Baroque architecture, which sits only half comfortably on its site. The, the site is a polygonal shape this elevation is okay, the right hand elevation is okay, the left arm is a bit short, but when you go around the back, the thing in terms of its coherence tends to rather fall apart. But it's a very typical building of, um, you know, what one might expect to find in Yokohama at this time. Lots of bank buildings, all in grand western architectural styles. The uh, Yokohama Open Port Memorial Hall, 1917, sort of sub 
sub sub Norman Shaw in terms of stripiness. Um, Shichigoro Yamada and Shiro Sato did this one. What's rather nice about so many of these public buildings is you can just wander in. Something is increasingly difficult to do in, in this country. At least we could do it in 2017. The uh, Kanagawa Prefectural Government Office Building of 1926-28 in the Imperial Crown style. This, this attempt by the Japanese government as much as anything, which was essentially run by the military, to push Japanese architecture into a traditional uh, form that didn't seem to be too Western. We saw this last time at the, um, the National Museum in Ueno Park, but here it's you know, in a, um, a prefecture or government building, Joshiro Obi and Iji uh, Kuwahara did this one. The next picture, which popped up just now, is the Yokohama Bankers Association building, 1936. The top floor was added later, but this is quite a, a nice, crisp, um, reductivist bit of Art Deco, I think, by uh, Yoshikuni Okuma and Gozo Hayasha. I went here uh, on my own on a previous visit. Let's go back, John. Back one. I went here on my own in a previous visit and asked if I could go in by gestures. The man was cleaning the stairs and um, he crossed his arms as if to say, no, no entry. So I took out my visiting card, which is in Japanese and gave it to him. And he nodded and nodded and rushed inside and came out with the um, director who ushered me around. So if you ever go to Japan, Take a visiting card and have it printed in Japanese. It makes all the difference. Thank you. Right, Foreign Office Architects Limited, one in competition, the Yokohama International Port Terminal, 1995 to 2002. I'm never very sure what to make of this. It looks a bit like a velodrome. It's a bit like a garden. It's a bit like a skate park. It's um, got a big ship beside it. Um, it's, it's very, very odd. And all this is just external space for wandering around. It doesn't serve any functional purpose. The purpose of the building is through these great um, galleried holes in it. And you go in, as we will see, there's vast halls inside. And this is where presumably you check in your luggage and do all that stuff. It's sometimes rather difficult to disassociate the ship from the architecture in this building, depending on where you're standing. So here we are inside one of those great halls with a folded um, metal roof, which is not structural, of course. There'll be um, trusses inside there. The main entrance, the main entrance from above with the ship. This was the Diamond Princess, um, which more recently came to national attention because it had a severe outbreak of uh, coronavirus. Uh, presumably, I don't know whether it's actually still uh, drifting somewhere in the ocean or it's actually finally been allowed to uh, burst somewhere. looking across the harbour to other ships. And this is the Hikawa Maru ocean liner uh, of 1928 to 1930. So it's probably one of only about five ships in the whole world, liners of the interwar period still left, if five um, actually has rather good Art Deco interiors. I, I don't know, but I, I would suggest that that ship might have been built on the Clyde. There were lots of the early Japanese um, ships built in the Glasgow shipboard, shipyards. Oh, this is the, um, what is it? 
was a port building, which is uh, next to the terminus. Oh, the Yokohama port building. Okay. And I suppose this is just what they do in Japan, which is you have a 1922 uh, building, um, then completely rebuilt with a 1989 building <laughs> on top in a most unsubtle uh, manner. Uh, but we saw quite a few of this in terms of the balance between old and new. And this was uh, part of, uh, we, we went round uh, after lunch, uh, one of the shopping streets with this sort of, sort of some, somewhat postmodern uh, uh, sort of shop, uh, set within a fairly, uh, you know, this is a typical um, uh, Japanese uh, shopping street. And then we came to this building, the um, Casta de Angela Wedding Bureau, um, which um, I guess at first glance looks a bit like a, um, you know, sort of, sort of a, a church, maybe a, sort of a, a New England church of the um, uh, 18th or 19th century, somewhat extended upwards, uh, quite considerably extended upwards, uh, but actually um, was built only eight years ago. And then back to you, Neil, and some serious architecture um, in uh, uh, Kanagawa. Okay, um, Kanagawa, this is Kunio Maikawa, who was the first Japanese architect to go and work for Le Corbusier, um, an enormously significant Japanese architect. And you're looking at the Kanagawa concert hall that was on the right, the previous picture, and um, the library, which is on the left. Well, it was in the previous picture, but John's <laughs> moving around the building. 1952 to 54. Maikawa was uh, very important. Here we are, this the underside. How did you get in there? The underside of the uh, concert hall, and you can see the seats above. This is the library, rather obviously. Kunio Maikawa was recommended for the RABA gold medal by the... Um, by the recommendation committee. And when that went to RIBA council, it was overruled and the award was given to Maxwell Fry. I don't know if you ever knew. And just adjacent to that is the uh, Prefectural Youth Centre, uh, 1960 to 62. You can see the older building in the distance on the right. This is also um, Kunio Maikawa. And Maikawa was the man who really trained up Kenzo Tangi. So you get this, um, these three generations, Le Corbusier to Maikawa to, ta to Kenzo Tangi. So if you think this is Corbusier, and you think some of Tangi's work is Corbusier, then that's why. I think this is one of my favorite buildings, Junso Sakukura, the Kanagawa Prefectural Museum of Modern Art in um, Kuraka uh, Kamakura. A building that is enormously at risk. I think it's I think it's safe, but I'm not sure. It has a lot of um, asbestos in it, and it is by this uh, architect John Sakakura, who worked for Le Corbusier in the 1930s, who did the Japanese Pavilion, the 1937 Paris Fair. This is 1951. Again, it's a it's a very Corbusian building. It uh, speaks of the Villa Savoie at Poissy. It is um, also a very Japanese building. And those steel columns that you, that you see going down at the front don't land on solid earth, they land on rocks, and they well, land on one rock each, and the rock is embedded in the, in the lake. The panelling around the outside, Ozo stone, volcanic stone from Japan. Ah, a British architect. This is Norman Foster. This is the Kamakura Museum of History and Culture in Kamakura 2002 to 2004, which I think is an extraordinary building in, in the sense of um, being rather confusing, uh, made of slightly weird materials and not altogether, to my mind, um, convincing. A series of horizontal uh, 
I'm sorry, it's a series of parallel walls in um, polished concrete, which have uh, trans translucent blocks of glass or whatever in them, with uh, the spaces between filled in, um, as you can see here, by probably bronze, um, bronze panelling and vertical strips, bronze glazing and so on. It's, um, yes, well, it is what you see. Note the light shining through the, the walls, it's rather good. This must be the ladies' toilet. That must be the gents. <laughs> Translucency is an inherent property of Japanese buildings. The, um, the shoji, the fusuma screens often let the light through, they would slide back to let it open as you can see here, but you know the thin paper that they used was um, was a translucent material and served to light the buildings even if it was gloomy outside. Port industrial buildings on the way back to Tokyo. We're on the bus. Sorry, we're on the coach, I should say. If there's a uniformity about Japanese um, architecture, it is modern architecture, is that it tends to be inherent, um, inherently grey. This is not a, <laughs> it's not a modern building, it's bright red. But <laughs> one notices going around Tokyo and the other big cities that a lot of the modern buildings are just grey in colour. This is the um, uh, Kiyomitsu Temple in Ueno Park. We're back in Tokyo now. Ueno Park is this big uh, museum area, uh, the north centre side of um, Tokyo, and this dates from 1632. This is the Karamon, 1651 um, in Ueno, the uh, Toshogu Shrine. Very typical Buddhist architecture, not to be mistaken for Shinto architecture, which is the in a sense, the, the national Japanese architecture, Buddhist architecture, of course, was imported from China. Bronze lanterns, 1651. Right, we are now at the other end of the first railway line that came from Yokohama to um, Tokyo. This is the old Shimbashi station building, which was rebuilt, but nevertheless looks like what it looked like before by uh, Richard Bridgens, who is an American engineer, architect, 1872. Another building that was rebuilt, um, I'm talking about the thing in the foreground, in the background, um, we can ignore that for the minute. This is the Mitsubishi Ichogan um, office building. Uh, Ichogan means first office, Ichi means one, first office building in this area um, of Tokyo, just by the main railway station. Uh, the Mitsubishi company built this and the result was that this whole area developed as um, a financial district, the beginning of, um, I don't know, finance in Tokyo. By Josiah Kondo, the British architect who is now um, architectural professor at um, Imperial College of Engineering, which became Tokyo University. His student, next one, Tokyo Railway Station, built by Josiah Kondo's uh, most impressive student, who was uh, Tatsuno Kingo. He was about three years younger than his professor. He was top of the class. He took over his professor's job as professor of architecture and built railway stations. Um, he built the Bank of Japan in Tokyo. He built a number of the banks of Japan in other cities, um, Kyoto being one of them. A very successful, very influential 
um, first generation Japanese architect, first generation in the Western sense of Japanese architecture. We're back to Konio Makawa, the Tokyo Marine uh, Nichido building, that tall tower there. Uh, it's in a, a sort of red glazed brick, which doesn't show up as bright red in this picture. And it's right on the edge of the Imperial Palace grounds. So if you're on the top floor there, you can look in and see what the emperor is doing in his back garden. It's a very impressive building. And this is by our own Michael Hopkins. Hopkins Associates, the Shin Maranucci Tower. Uh, Shin meaning new, of course, Maranucci being the name given to this district, this area just by the main railway station where the, the first um, office building, the Ichikokan, uh, was built for Matsubishi. So Maranucci is like um, the city in London. 2001 to 2007, Hopkins. A kabuki theater. Um, this is interesting. The Shinichiro Akada uh, Kabuki Theater, uh, dating from, well, it was rebuilt a number of times. This is a concrete version of it, um, built in 1951, earlier one, 1925. And it's now got a big tower on top of it, which I think we could have seen just in the first picture, but don't worry about it. It's, um, you know, it's, it's the main. Kabuki Theatre in Tokyo and it's done in the, the Buddhist style in concrete. This is the central post office, is it? It is, yes. Yes, okay, by Tatsu, uh, Tatsuro Yoshida and he was one of the, um, the early um, modernist architects in Japan who in a sense broke away from the traditional Western teaching that went on in the Imperial College of Engineering or Tokyo University. And uh, the Bunhira group, they called themselves, they were um, like the Viennese secessionists. They seceded from the norm and adopted Western modernist architecture. Hans Polzig, for instance, was very much the sort of architect they liked looking at. And they traveled around Europe, met Fortigropius and so on. So uh, Tatsura Yoshido, did this post office. It must, was a much, oh, you can see it there at the bottom of that glass tower. The post office was actually quite a big building. It seems to be totally dwarfed now. So that's the post office tower by Murphy Yan, the um, American firm, 2009 to 12. Doesn't altogether respect the scale of the um, earlier building. <laughs> And this was a fairly common theme, I think, in Tokyo. Yes. Um, okay, we, we're sort of moving out towards uh, the, the Imperial Palace here. There's this long road that runs down the side of the Palace Gardens with a whole series of fine buildings from the 1930s through to the, the present day located along here. This is where the Imperial Hotel had been by Frank Lloyd Wright. It would have been down to the right of this picture. Uh, you're looking at the Meiji uh, Saimi Khan uh, building, the life insurance building by uh, Sinichiro Okada, 1932 to 34. You could expect to see a building like this in Chicago or Washington or London of that date. But um, this is different. It's about the same date. This is by Hitoshi Watanabe or Jin Watanabe, as he was known, the Daiichi Saimi uh, building rebuilt as the DN Tower by Kevin Roach and John Dinkaloo on the back there, which I think is rather a good addition, much better, I would suggest, than Murphy Yarn's one to the old post office, or maybe more appropriate. By the same architect, Jin Watanabe, who was the man who won the competition in the end for the, um, the National Museum in Ueno Park in the 1930s, this is the Ginzo uh, Wako department store, W-A-K-O. And if you're wanting to meet your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you arrange to meet them under the clock at Wako. So, um, you know, this is the place to go. It's a bit like Selfridges. It has that um, great tradition of 
departmental store about it. Here is a fascinating building by Murano and Mori. Uh, Murano we, we saw in the uh, World Cathedral in Hiroshima a few minutes ago. This is the Neon Semi Hibiya building with incorporating in, within it the Nisai Theatre and it's 1961 to 63. I'm not talking about the big building behind, I'm talking about this, this really rather um, expressionist piece of um, architecture. A fabulous interior. You know, to see a theatre somehow combined with um, a commercial building is, is, is unique. Great stone uh, pilotti reminding one perhaps of the stones that go around the um, traditional Japanese um, castles, as we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Now we're back in Ueno Park. Again, Kunio Makawa, the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum, 1975. Makawa changed um, pattern, changed style, changed approach, it seemed, in the later part of his life. And there seems to be much more of Alvarado or something else, something like that in here than, um, than Le Corbusier. This building is on various levels, um, as you can see in this, in this illustration, sunken courtyard gardens. When it rains in Japan, it rains very heavily, so the need for enclosed outdoor space or covered outdoor space is much appreciated. This is the great sphere through which Carolyn was looking um, at the beginning of our first presentation two weeks ago. And there's John photographing himself in it. The one bit of Tadio Ando that we, we came across, the extension to the International Library of Children's Literature at um, Ueno Park. Again, not um, paying much heed to the building behind it, but quite light, quite um, inobtrusive in its way. And this is the, um, this is the original building by uh, Masamichi Kura and Hideo Mamitsu of 1906. So that, I suppose, is the end of the serious architecture, but um, just to finish off with, um, I mean, we did get out, we did look at other things apart from uh, just fabulous um, 20th century architecture, uh, and we particularly went out at night a, a couple of times to this district uh, in Shinagawa in Tokyo. Um, this is actually the Tenuzu Furai Bridge, um, which looks very traditional, um, but in fact is from uh, 1996, um, which took us into this sort of basin uh, area, sort of almost a mini um, island, um, where our destination was the um, Torada Arts Complex, which is uh, sort of based within a, a series of former uh, warehouses uh, in uh, Shin Shinagawa. Um, which, so I suppose the warehouses, not hugely interesting buildings from about 1950s onwards, but actually it's what those buildings have been, how they've been converted uh, and what they contain, which is um, of such interest and in how um, they've been extended. It's now an entire sort of arts complex um, and um, we went there a couple of times actually before we go in to see what is done now here's this rather fabulous uh, mural which I guess is don't know what the date is looks as if it's sort of 1960 um, uh, which is on the, uh, 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 the base of one of the warehouses but we went, uh, the reason for going, I think we went twice. The first time was to see this fabulous art shop called uh, Pigment uh, Art Supply uh, Laboratory, not a shop, an art supply laboratory um, by Kengo Kuma um, of uh, 2014 to 2015. 
uh, where even, uh, and it's, it's very much like a laboratory, even the pigments and the, uh, uh, and that's what it's called, pigments, all the art materials become very much uh, a, an artwork in themselves. In fact, uh, they had fabulous art materials, but you didn't almost want to buy them because you didn't want to uh, destroy or compromise the fabulous compositions. So if you need in, any art supplies, pigment certainly in Tokyo is, is absolutely the place to go or order them from. This was another example of the hospitality of the Japanese. The shop was closed, as I recall, but there's sort of 10 of us outside rubbing our noses on the glass and they opened the doors and let us in, which was extremely generous of them. And the second time we went there, back to the same arts complex uh, with Tom Croft, who, who uh, suggested we ought to go. So a group of us went to look at the um, Archie Depot Architectural Model Museum um, within the arts complex, which was uh, both an architectural model workshop but also a sort of depot, a depository or museum of architectural models, which had literally um, opened only, I think, that year. So uh, 2017, so absolutely brand new. So the whole warehouse full of uh, architectural models, um, all beautifully uh, looked after uh, and uh, archived. Um, most stunning uh, place. Um, including this extraordinary uh, concept. Uh, I don't think it has been built, but what a, a, an amazing idea. And uh, on our way back, we saw this uh, really rather fabulous uh, um, multi-story or mini multi-story car park, very much a Japanese thing, uh, storage of cars. And then back uh, to uh, Shinagawa Station uh, and the square where our hotel was based for one uh, last look. Um, uh, a typical, I suppose, Tokyo or Japanese contemporary scene. As you say, as Neil says during the day, uh, grey buildings, um, mostly lots of, but actually enlivened uh, by all the neon and the signage, uh, 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 which then creates a colour. Uh, uh, and within the station, here was this rather fabulous um, uh, uh, food shop. Um, very typical. Selling the, Jimmy uh, sushi. All the bento boxes on display. And then how we got around. Uh, well, um, not everything is grey because the wonderful bullet trains, which go in excess of 200 miles an hour, beautifully silent, uh, perfect in terms of getting you uh, there on time, run like clockwork. Well here uh, is uh, a couple of them which took us uh, all the way around uh, Japan. Um, uh, objects not just of huge efficiency and comfort but also um, great beauty as well. I suppose lastly at the very end we just again have to thank um, our wonderful guide, uh, Aiko Ito, here she is, uh, and of course, Neil, um, for uh, uh, doing what was such a tremendous tour. Um, but also, um, thank you again, Neil, um, for uh, giving uh, this talk tonight. So I think that's the end of it. So back over to you, Neil and Catherine. Well, thank you, John. Um, this wouldn't be the same without your photographs and your ability to take off, find things that nobody knew about, take brilliant pictures and get back on time to the bus or the train or whatever it was. So um, this is a great, great addition to the tour. Thank you, John. Thank you. Catherine, you're mute. You're mute. Be muting. <laughs> Hello, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, I'm holding up the a set of the, these cards of um, John's lovely images that we've had made 
Um, I don't think John's even seen them yet. So um, they are hot off the press and we're going to send those out to anyone who donates £10 or more tonight. We can't see them. Well, You've got the screen up. Oh, you've got the screen up. Well, they're very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can we do that now? Yes. Can you see me now? We can see them now. Lovely. Okay. Um, but thank you both very, very much. We had a couple of questions on the chat, but I think they were more about clarify, clarifying and repeating things. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll email those people separately um, as it's getting late. But thank you very much. I mean, it looks, I'm you know, even more envious than I was before because I wasn't able to go. You saw such an amazing mix of buildings from so many different periods and styles um, with um, such expertise. Um, to guide you and um, um, I mean like like all our trips I think you obviously packed in an absolutely enormous amount into the time available so um, thank you both both Neil for organizing the trip and the two of you for, for, for sharing it with us tonight good night thank you good night Catherine good night, good night.